So here we are in central Hawke's Bay on the 19th of March 1997 on the property of Jamie Gunson who is in the process of doing a major conversion into a techno system. And Jamie I'll introduce right here who is converting how many hectares Jamie? Good afternoon. Um, there's 550 hectares in the property probably about 480 will be convertible. And um, over what time frame are you going to convert that? Um, <coughs> well we started about a, we started about three or four weeks ago. We, w we want to get five systems five systems in this winter which is 140 hectares um, and I think probably we'll just keep, keep going and uh, ideally I'd like to have the rest of it done by next winter. So 12 months really. Okay, it's obviously a very major decision to uh, take on an exercise of the scale. What, what point was it that you came to that made you take the plunge? What, uh, was it something you arrived at overnight or...? Um, <laughs> well, the main, the main reason was that my, um, my outgoings were exceeding my incoming. <laughs> so it was, it was really a... I, I, I had to do something to uh, remain profitable, really. So your first uh, contact with the system was where? Uh, my first real contact with it was at John Hudson's, yeah, to, to see it up and running there. And that from that date until when you took the plunge yourself was what, about two or three years? Uh, would have been a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, the beef crash uh, had quite a bearing on it because obviously you know, we were only getting half what we were getting before, so it impacted greatly on our profitability. And it was a, it was a matter of trying to find out how we could um, keep that profitability up. Could you give us some of the basic sort of data of what where it came from? Was it was a sheep and beef property, and how uh, many? It's been a, traditionally it was uh, I inherited a sheep and beef property, which was stud sheep and stud cattle. Um, and over time, I realised that the stud business wasn't really my passion and um, it, it didn't really suit my nature and, and apart from that I couldn't see it being a highly profitable sort of operation anyway unless you were in the top 5% probably. So we, we gradually became a commercial beef and sheep, um, uh, some breeding, mostly trading. There's quite a bit of infrastructure on the farm in terms of fences and laneways and roads and so forth. How, how many paddocks in total? There's 50 paddocks here now. 50 paddocks. And are any of those uh, fences going to remain in place or the whole lot coming no, out? They'll, they'll all go. The whole lot will go. And, and how many dams? We, there's a dam we see in the distance that's... There's a uh, dam in every paddock. <laughs> ...being removed? There's a dam in every paddock. Probably, we could probably get away with... Uh, not having to get rid of them all straight away, but any that are in the road of a of a of a fence line, we'll have to get rid of. So we're in the process of filling them in at the moment. So that's a reasonable expense just getting rid of those. That's sort of how many uh, machine days? Well, it's it's basically two machines, one day per dam. Sorry, and how many dams again? Well, it, there'll be there's 50 in total on the whole farm. One, one every paddock. We've, we've had a, the water system here has been uh, completely dam water. We've had no reticulation at all. So every paddock has got a dam. Right, and this farm's fairly contoured, so that's going to create problems with, first of all, setting the system out in terms of post positioning. Yeah, and well, we, we opted to go for a 60 day round because it, it's going to offer us more gear changes but not only that we're going to have to have extra posts because of the contour in any case so it wasn't going to be uh, a, a greater cost to have 60 cells as opposed to 40 because we would need the extra posts due to contour and uh, we've run the lanes across the contour across the valleys and across the creeks so that the brake fences are not going to be crossing obstacles all the time, and also it means that the cattle, uh, if, the, if the lanes were running the other way, they'd be down in the valleys a lot of the time, and the ones up on the ridges would be stay up on the ridges.
getting to the actual design aspect of it, what particular problems did that present? How difficult was it to set the thing out in the uh, optimum fashion? Um, it wasn't that difficult. It was really just just finding out w what fitted into the to the boundaries the best, and what size um, lanes and cells we wanted. So we set parameters where where we wanted to aim for ideally 20 balls a mob. And once we decided on that, that's really set the parameters of the size of the lanes. These lanes here are 4.8 hectares at four and a half to the acre, I think that gives us 20 balls. Um, but without, um, without being able to design it on a computer and then transfer it into, into a GPS to do the layout, it would be virtually impossible, I would think. I don't know how else you'd do it. Looking at the guys doing a bit of uh, setting out using the GPS system. It's a two-man operation. We've got Tom Chisholm using the GPS unit and Jason is following behind with his golf cart and doing the postings. So Jamie, uh, perhaps you could explain why why are you using this system? Well, well, the only other way to do it is with measuring wires or, or tape measures and once you start getting off the flat onto rolling country or, or hill country there's you know, there's a lot of problems doing that uh, and the other reason is that that these cell shapes are all different the lanes are narrower at one end than they are at the other end so we've got converging lanes so every post is, is a slightly different distance than the last post because as, as the lanes get wider the post spacings which marks the cell length get shorter so the posts are not all exactly the same um, in fact, none of them are the same by that account. No, in fact, none of them are the same. They're all different. So, so I just don't see any other way of doing it. It means it, it means that you can do quite complicated systems, um, which Simon does in the mapping program with all sorts of funny shaped lanes and and lengths and what have you, length cell shapes. And then all he does is transfer that data into the GPS with all the coordinates for every post. And then you just get on the ground and map it out according to what what the GPS tells you, and it's all accurate, done, finished. And any ballpark figures on the the sort of gross margins that you you would have had under the previous regime versus what you expect from this? Oh, we'll, we'll be miles ahead with this. Um, we're we're doing a lot of. It's not like we're a bull bee farmers that have converted to to uh, techno system bull beef farmers we're actually going away from steer farming away from cows and away from sheep into bull beef so it's quite a big leap uh, just just to go to bull beef and the reasoning behind that is that we're in the business of converting grass to meat and the most efficient way of doing that really is is bull beef and this is the most efficient way to handle bulls um, with the prospect of doubling our stocking rate so we're going from Two and a half bulls per hectare, or bull equivalents, to uh, four and a half or five. So we're going from 11 to 12 stock units per hectare to 20 to 25 stock units per hectare for almost no loss of performance. <coughs> Excuse me. And labour-wise, you'll go. You've been a solo, one-man operation. Oh no, we're sort of about three labour units normally, um, and that. That'll be the same. There'll be no increase in labour costs. In fact, it's probably going to be a slight decrease. So this was a property where you used to make lots of hay and, and hay and silage and crops. No hay, no silage, no supplementary cr crops. All grass.